July 30, 2018. The international press gathered in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, facing journalists, four civil aviation specialists. They conducted an extraordinary investigation, that of the disappearance of flight MH370 with 239 people on board. For more than four years, the families of the victims are waiting for answers. Today, investigators will finally present their findings collected in a report of nearly 500 pages. But what they're going to say will surprise you. We are going to tell you the story of Flight Amish 370. Five years later, the families of the passengers, they are still unaware of the circumstances of the disappearance of the aircraft. How can such a machine of this size just disappear? The crew replies, good night, a basic banal message. From the moment the plane says good night and leaves Malaysian airspace, anything can happen. We have resumed the investigation, analyzed all the hypotheses, all the scenarios, accident, terrorist act, missile. What has really happened? This disappearance is not clear. There are people who know. When lithium batteries, it makes a hole in the plane. After 15 minutes, they are dead. Landing on a remote islet in the region, I have to say that I consider it. A priori, it would not be an accident. It's not an accident. I am convinced that this plane has been hijacked. On an island south of the Maldives, people saw a big plane. They don't know the intentions of a plane like that that doesn't respond. At that moment, they would have no choice but to shoot him down. Nothing should be ruled out. Kuala Lumpur, March 7, 2014. Night falls over the capital of Malaysia. Today is Friday, a holiday in this Muslim country. However, at the airport, numerous flights are scheduled for that evening. On the billboard, there is one for Beijing MH370. It is operated by Malaysia Airlines. It is scheduled to leave at 12.25 a.m and the plane that's going to make the trip is a Boeing 777, one of the prides of the American aircraft manufacturer. The Boeing 777, it is a marvel of aeronautics. It's a plane that works very well. Who did not have a major incident? Pilots consider it to be the best airplane in the world. To fly the MH370, the lot shows Zahari Shah, 53, a devotee of the Malaysian. He started sailing with them 30 years ago and has already totaled 18,000 flight hours. The captain was extremely experienced. He was an absolute expert on his aircraft. His simulator that he had at home was based on the aircraft that they were flying that day. He knew everything about that plane. This commander was well known in this company, especially for its seriousness. At his side, a young co-pilot, Farouk Abdelhamid, an enthusiast who started flying at the age of 20. He is only 27 years old. First officer was new to the Boeing 777, and um, he had been trained, but this was his first flight without a training instructor. But he was flying with a very experienced captain. It is 22 o'clock. Surveillance cameras show the pilot and the co-pilot safely pass through the security gates before getting on the plane. Nothing to report. Next are the 10 hostesses and stewards of the Malaysian. 
It's a very ordinary, trivial theft. The pilot and the co-pilot will take note of the flight plan, will observe the list of cargo, freight, are going to look at the weather, which is good that day, and take a quick look at the passenger list. It's a robbery like there are 20,000 every day in the world. An hour later, passengers bound for Beijing are invited to join the departure lounge of Flight MH370. Boarding is as ordinary as it gets. Check-in, luggage check, passport control. Eleven twenty p.m. Passengers sit on board the Boeing seven hundred and seventy seven. The cabin is not full. There are two hundred and twenty seven passengers. We mainly have Orientals, Chinese people, Malaysians stopping over or leaving for Beijing, and a few Westerners, including a French family who is the Watrellis family. A French family living in Beijing. The mother Lawrence, the daughter Amber, the son Adrian, and his girlfriend Yan, all seated in the same row. At 25 seats D, E, F, and G. There is also a rather unusual group of travelers, 20 Chinese and Malaysian engineers working for the same company. Freescale, an American company very advanced in miniature electronics. At seat 11C, another IBM engineer, Philip Wood, the only American adult on MH370. At 1225A, the Boeing was finally ready to leave. Passengers are on board the plane. The crew is on board the plane. The control services know the scheduled departure time. At some point, the plane calls to ask for permission to drive. The crew makes this request once everything is closed, the doors are closed, that the plane is free from the ground. It will drive to track 32 on the right, because it's the one assigned to him. It is night. It's about 12.30 a.m. local time. It is allowed to take off. The plane takes off normally. No problems of any kind have been identified. It's getting to cruising altitude. On the order of 35,000 feet, I think. For their flight to Beijing, which is going to be flying over the South China Sea, probably just about been dozing by the time that the aircraft took off. It's late at night. They're flying out in the, into the dark. Um, they're perfectly normal. The takeoff, the original, the original conversation with air traffic control is all completely as expected and normal. Until the moment there is a contact and he is told, you're about to leave our airspace. You are about to arrive in Vietnamese airspace. The crew replies, good night, a very basic banal message. Night flying is a very moving thing, very friendly. 
the atmosphere is a bit special. When you move away from one land to reach another land, that we are over a sea, there is a little goodbye, and that looks like goodbye. There is always a little hello that has an air of Earth at last. This is what exists in all browsers, whether sailors or aviators. Afterwards, the Boeing continued on its normal course, with all standard settings. It flies 11,000 meters above sea level at a speed of 850 kilometers slash m. If all goes well, it should land in Beijing on time. They are speaking to Kuala Lumpur, air traffic control, and there's a little oddity where they repeat twice uh, what, their, what their current level is, which is probably meaningless, but that was the only slightly odd thing. At which point they sign off, they're ready to change to speak to Vietnam air traffic control. But at 1.21 a.m. local time, at the precise moment when it is due to enter Vietnamese airspace, the Boeing loses all contact with the ground. Inspectors saw the stain disappear. They may wonder if it's the crew who made a handling error, if it's a problem on the Malaysian radar system. They're going to get information from the Vietnamese to try to see where the error is coming from. At the moment, we are in a control problem. Perhaps there is another explanation for the silence of the plane. Because at that hour of the night, the Boeing flies over part of the China Sea, where communications have a reputation for being difficult. It's a bad area for radio transmission because you're over a body of water and it's just not got particularly good coverage. In France, even if you're flying over the Bay of Biscay, there are areas where you're talking to one controller, you're switching to the next controller, and there's a period in the middle where you're not able to hear as well as you could or not able to broadcast as well as you should. There is no longer any contact between the ground and this plane. The controllers no longer know how to reach him. The planes flying in the region have no contact with him. The radars don't see it anymore. So in one fell swoop, around 1.38 a.m., we find ourselves with a plane that is isolated from the world. In these cases, the first thing you think of, it's an insurmountable weather problem. Did the Boeing experience a particularly violent storm, which would have damaged its engines and forced the pilots to divert? On a neighboring island, Some of the theories are that the aircraft landed someplace. It's rule number one. When you have an engine fire, they tell you, you land on the nearest ground. Not just any land, no, the nearest land. We checked with our colleagues. In the early morning, there were lots where you could land with the 777. The landing on a remote island in the region. I have to say that I considered it. According to this specialist, the Boeing could have landed in a disaster on one of the 16,000 islands in the region. As soon as the plane disappeared, many of them share this idea, inspired by the famous American series Lost. The story of passengers left to fend for themselves after a plane crash. But in this case, there is a problem. If there were survivors of this landing, why didn't any of them try to use their cell phones? We remember all these air disasters where a mother, knowing that she was going to die, called her child. By leaving a goodbye message that says, you'll tell your dad that I love him, to Duras, Ox and Fons, and there is a crash. Now that's not the case at all, because among all these passengers that are a lot of Chinese people, Chinese people always have one or even two cell phones. There's no one who's going to call, none. 
I no longer believe in this hypothesis that I dared to broadcast because I found it relatively reassuring compared to the worst. Far from suspecting the drama unfolding 3,600 kilometers away, the 20 million Pekingis have already been raised. Even on this Saturday morning, many are getting ready to go to work. Others are on their way to the airport. Despite the hour in the morning, family and friends came to wait for the passengers on the daily flight from Malaysia Airlines, coming from Kuala Lumpur. Landing is scheduled for 6.30 am. At the same time, Ghislaine Watrolos is also on a plane bound for Beijing. He is eager to be reunited with his wife, Lawrence, 52 years old, and two of her children, Amber, 14, and Adrian, 17. On the evening of March 7, I took a plane from Paris to Beijing. My family was coming back from a week in Malaysia, vacation, February break. I had to spend the second week with my children. In Beijing, an American woman waits with the same eagerness, the return to China of his partner, Philip Wood, also a passenger on flight Amage 370. We're in the process of moving from uh, Beijing to KL. Uh, we've been in Beijing for quite some time and we're ready for something new. You know, we were both really excited to see each other. It had been February 9th that we'd said goodbye here in KL. The wait for the families of the passengers begins. The plane was announced late. The minutes pass and the faces get more and more serious. Everyone thinks that something unusual has happened. I don't have any more information. At first, they said the plane was late. They gave me this paper and told me to wait. Well, Philip should have pinged me from the plane on landing at 6.30, and that didn't happen. So I had tried to reach him and just got a, you know, a no answer on both his Malaysian and Chinese phones. At 10.30 am, there was still no news of MH370. It should have been four hours since it should have landed. The display board remains attached to this information alone. The plane is delayed. And for the first time, officials are going to speak out. There is nothing very reassuring about what they are about to say. Very early this morning, we have received worrisome information. A Malaysia Airlines plane, en route to Beijing, has lost all contact with ground control. MH370 disappeared from radar screens at 1.21 a.m. local time. It was located between Malaysia and Vietnam, right in the middle of the China Sea. For families, this information is a big hit. I was on the plane when this incident happened. When I arrive at 16 o'clock, I am received by the French consul at the foot of the plane, who tells me there was a misfortune, the plane disappeared, it's over. What families don't know it's because this announcement hides an incredible malfunction. For several hours, no one seemed to care about the plane disappearing. When you lose contact with a plane, there are three known phases. I am CEOR, alert, distress. It means uncertainty, alert, and distress. First, in CERFA, the phase of uncertainty. We continue to search among us. We call ourselves the control centers. We call the planes next door. ALERFA, we are starting to implement research resources. We alert the authorities. We are preparing for something potentially serious. After a while without any contact, 
that obviously something bad has happened. We are going to trigger what we call the DETR ESFA. All controllers, everyone will be notified that there is an airplane, this type, this place, that has disappeared. We don't know where he is. So you have to start looking. That's a plane that diverted and landed without anyone knowing where. Maybe a wreck or an accident. Curiously, in the case of Flight MH370, it will take almost four hours for the airline to react, as this official report shows. They are recorded, minute by minute, all actions that have been triggered, from the moment the device disappeared from the radar screens. It states that at 1.38 am, Vietnam air traffic controllers inform Kuala Lumpur that they no longer have any contact with MH370. And it wasn't until four hours later, at 5.30 in the morning, this Saturday, March 8, that the search is launched. Do you realize? We waited four hours between the last signal from the plane and official searches and the official declaration saying that this plane disappeared. It's very clear that the information, if the inf correct information had been acted upon immediately, we would know what was happening. How to explain that the Malaysian Air Force did not occur on the night of 8 March 2014? as would be required by the safety protocols in force in aviation. An intervention that could perhaps have changed the destiny of the plane and its 239 occupants. It's unimaginable to let a ghost plane sail for four hours when we know that no one is holding the handle anymore. Imagine in France, a plane that leaves Rossi for England and who suddenly, abruptly makes a U-turn. Within five minutes, the French fighter will come to escort the plane, tell him, what are you doing? Then if it gets too close to cities, too close to Paris, we'll shoot him down. When the 9-11, post-9-11 age, the concept that a military as advanced as the Malaysian government with ample fighter jet resources would have ignored a 777 of its capital city is astounding to me, and they've never yet given any explanation for that. However, someone knows the explanation. The powerful man in the Malaysian government, the Minister of Defense, he's the one who handled the whole MH370 affair and who knows a lot of secrets. So when the plane disappears from the radar screens, why did the minister not order a search and that we intercept the ghost plane? It wasn't threatening. It was a commercial robbery. It came from our airspace and we are not at war with anyone. If a child is standing at the edge of the cliff and you see them there, you should have a, a moral, moral obligation to pull them back from the cliff, right? Just to stand there and watch them jump over the edge is not the right thing to do, and that's kind of what the Malaysian government has done here, is they've just stood there and watched something disappear. I'm not going to, I'm not going to shoot it down. What's the point of sending it up? Well, to see it going, you need a fighter for that? They were talking about, about military procedures. And if I did shoot it down, you'd be the first to say, how can you shoot down a commercial airline with 14 nationals Half of them Chinese, I'll be in a worse position probably. An astonishing statement in front of the camera and with a smile. The passivity of the Malaysian authorities is one of the very first anomalies of this case. And it's not the last. More than 11 hours after the aircraft disappeared, the flight is always reported to be late. The parents, the children of the passengers, are crazy worried. The company gathers them at a hotel near the airport. They were so disorganized at the beginning. It was absolutely traumatic. 
Air Malaysia had set up a large room in a hotel in Beijing where all the families were there. You are coming. A swarm of journalists take your picture. There are 200 people in a room who are screaming, crying. We leave you in this room. Nothing happened. In front of the press and the families, the CEO of Malaysian shows his helplessness. We are very saddened this morning by the information from Flight MH370. The Malaysian authorities contacted the Vietnamese authorities to try to find the plane. Right away, I said, I'm not staying here, I'm going home. I went home and was left alone for 48 hours. I didn't want to see anyone. I am not happy with the way the company is treating us. She's snubbing us. My son was 30. He had gone to Malaysia for work. We did have a quote-unquote caregiver give us a call, but all they could say is we don't know anything. That same situation still exists today. We still don't know anything at all. The hours pass and the mystery deepens, since disappearing from the radar screens at 1.21 a.m., MH370 left behind no echo, no trace. As if the Boeing had simply disappeared. How is that possible? How could such a mass pass out just over the China Sea? Gerard Arnoux is a confirmed Air France pilot who has always been interested in air disasters and their causes. But in this specific case, he himself has no answer. We realize that we are very small next to a machine like that. It's not a small plane. That leads us to ask ourselves the question, how can a machine of this size disappear? It emits a lot of heat, it makes noise. There is no Bermuda Triangle on machines of this size. It is unthinkable. The Boeing 777 is a flying monster, 63 meters long, 60 meters of wingspan and a weight of 350 tons. But it's also a smart plane. With its AD embedded computers, he is never alone in the sky. These machines, that's the interesting thing. It's that it communicates. It's full of electronics, communication systems. On the roof, there are satellite antennas, boxes that communicate alone, that send signals. It is unthinkable to consider that a high-performance aircraft permanently connected to the ground by radio and satellite could thus disappear. So what happened on the Malaysian Boeing that night? We reconstructed the flight in a simulator with exactly the same settings. Same flight plan, same altitude, and same weather conditions. We can see that there are still a few clouds, but it's a quiet night. Nothing special about this classic flight. We're crossing Malaysia, heading to the Gulf of Thailand. The automatic pilot is on. It will rise to an altitude of 35,000 feet. It will follow the route that I have already entered in these two boxes. Meanwhile, the famous transponder sends a message to the air traffic controller. This message is transmitted by radio or satellite. It is vital. Because it gives the exact position of the plane in the sky, its speed, altitude, and trajectory. So far, we're on a completely classic flight. Air traffic controllers know where I am. 
They know what altitude I am at, that I am well on the road for which I was given permission to fly. In one fell swoop, in a minute, we're going to lose plane identification. The air traffic controller won't see me anymore. Indeed, the transponder that connects the plane to air traffic control is suddenly cut off. The second, more complex element, which is cut off at the same time, a minute apart, it's the famous ACARS case. This ACARS box sends via satellite. It sends engine management information, the quantity of fuel consumed, the rotational speed of the motors, the thrust of the engines, the temperature. All of these elements disappear at once. And if these two pieces of equipment have stopped working, it may mean that the plane crashed at sea. The day after the disappearance, on March 9, 2014, research in the China Sea start at the very spot where the plane stopped sending a signal. The search and rescue team has started since morning. Everyone has put in an effort and yet we have not found any wreckage, no wreckage whatsoever. But if no debris is found, maybe that means the plane continued on its way. An outside hand would have acted to prevent the location of the device. We asked Gerard Arnoux to show us how to deactivate in a Boeing, the transponder, and the ACRS. If you turn off the transponder, which is very easy to do, just switch it to off. The plane disappears from the radar screens, purely and simply. Deactivating ACARS is a different story, because the system is hidden in the cargo compartment of the aircraft. To access it, you have to go to the cabin. Lift a hatch and go down to reach an imposing electrical panel. To cut ACARS, you had to access a breaker, therefore a fuse, and you had to pull a fuse to put the ACARS out of service. I don't know them, but one of these fuses cuts off the ACARS. ACARS, you have to go in the hold, you have to know where the breakers are to cut it. I never learned, and none of my colleagues that I telephoned, British or French, he did not learn how to go and cut an ACARS in his machine qualification. I don't know how to do it. So who could have deactivated ACARS from the Malaysian Airlines Boeing? Either this pilot knew the place because he had learned about it, which is quite complicated. Well, if he's a terrorist, he knew the procedure, this fairly rare, exceptional procedure, to find the location of ACARS and especially to be able to unplug it. Research in the China Sea do not allow the slightest piece of debris to be found. So investigators are wondering if the plane, after disappearing from the radar screens, did not actually continue its course. Were there one or more pirates among the passengers? The list of travelers in the cabin is combed through. Precisely in this list, there are two names which are particularly intriguing for police officers. That of an Austrian Christian Kozel and that of an Italian Luigi Moraldi. In fact, incredible thing, we will find that the two men never got on board. The Thai police find Moraldi and Kozel smiling. Who tell them about their misadventures? Uh, I show a report from police about still passport, and after uh, I make a new passport. Uh... So who was sitting in seats 30C and 34C, where Kozel and Moraldi were supposed to sit? The videos from the airport will be stripped and Malaysian investigators find out with surprise that the Italian and the Austrian have been replaced by two stowaways. Today we have uncovered two passengers which 
uh, was travelling on a stolen passport. Okay? And uh, we have identified one of them and, and he is an Iranian. We believe that he is an Iranian. And here he is, this young Iranian. He is 19 years old and was traveling with an accomplice, another 29-year-old Iranian. Even more disturbing detail, the two men bought their tickets at the same time from Thailand, as can be seen from the numbers of their following tickets. The two Iranians are immediately singled out, as is Kuala Lumpur Airport and its security. We realize that the two passengers bought their tickets in Thailand the same day with stolen passports. Inevitably, it arouses the attention of investigators who are thinking of the criminal trail. How is it thinkable that after the attacks of 11 September 2001, two passengers with fake passports can pass through security checks and get on a plane without worries? Several testimonies claim that Kuala Lumpur Airport would show flaws in its security procedures. I went to Kuala Lumpur Airport. The security checks are not those at Orly, from Roissy, or from New York. It was much more lax. We also know that in Kuala Lumpur, with a little money, you can get on a plane without being entered on the passenger list. Is the plane in the hands of dangerous terrorists? The hypothesis could not be more credible. Remember September 11, 2001. America is the victim of an unprecedented terrorist attack. Before that day, who could have imagined that several airliners can be hijacked and then fly over a city and embed themselves in buildings? So, the two Iranian passengers who were traveling with stolen passports, did they take control of the Malaysian Boeing? And if so, what were their motivations? The trail seems enticing, but very quickly, a denial by the Malaysian police will put an end to this first lead. We have been uh, uh, checking his background, and uh, we believe that he is not likely to be a member of any terrorist group. And we, uh, we believe that he is trying to migrate to Germany. Police investigations will not allow to identify any new suspects among the other passengers at this time. On the other hand, in the cockpit, it's not the same story. All eyes are on pilot Zahari Ahmad Shah and his co-pilot Farik Abdul Hamid. Investigating the drivers is complicated. There are contradictory things, and their resumes would be heavier that they don't want to tell us. First, let's look at the co-pilot. He's a 27-year-old young man, well incapable of hurting anyone, his sister will say. For him, this flight was a big first. first officer was new to the Boeing 777, and um, he had been trained, but this was his first flight without a training instructor. However, the investigation will show flaws in the young man. For example, he seemed to take some liberties with air regulations. Proof of this is the testimony of this young Australian woman. In 2011, on vacation with a friend, she was allegedly invited into the cockpit by Farik Abdul Hamid. We were queuing at the boarding gate, like everyone else, when the drivers passed us, then they came back to us. They told us, do you want to spend the flight in the cockpit with us? That day, not only this Australian woman and her friends spent the entire flight in the cockpit. Worse, they were present during the takeoff and landing phases. This is strictly prohibited by the regulations. Throughout the flight, they talked to us. They were smoking. I didn't think that was happening, 
At one point they were so much in the conversation that they had turned back to us. One of them took my friend's hand and said, your hand is so fine. You are a very creative person and comments about her polished nails, things like that. He's a little bit of a bling boy who likes celebrities. As soon as someone famous walks through the door of his plane, he invites him to see it, to look. He likes stars, he likes bling. But it's not because you're frivolous that you're a terrorist. The fact remains that young Farrakh's behavior is intriguing. An anonymous investigator will reveal that the co-pilot, before the plane disappeared from civilian radars, would have tried to call a mysterious correspondent. Why? Mystery. Malaysian investigators will also look into on the personality of the pilot, Zahari Ahmad Shah. A 53-year-old man, very experienced and a priori above suspicion. Only by digging into his life, the investigators will discover numerous gray areas. First of all, by searching his home. A week after the disappearance of the aircraft, the police sees a flight simulator. Here it is, a device that he made himself. He has never hidden the fact that he has a simulator at his house. It's in Facebook, it's everybody's proud of it. Hi everyone, uh, this is a YouTube video that I've made. Um, um, when I've asked him before why he's built the simulator in his home, it's because he, he, his, that is his hobby. Um, he enjoys flying and he wants to share that joy of flying with his friends. And having a simulator at home is just a perfect way to do it. I know lots of pilots who pass their time on simulators in their free time, because they like it and they actually do it through play. For the authorities, it's not so much the simulator that's the problem, but what's in its memory. This was confirmed very quickly by Malaysian investigators. Local and international expertise have been recruited to examine the pilot's flight simulator. Some data has been deleted from the simulator, and forensic work to retrieve this data is ongoing. It's not the only oddity. Zahari Ahmad Shah was also training on his simulator to land on very short runways. It's going to be intriguing. Did he plan to hijack the flight and land it somewhere on a small island in the Indian Ocean? The pilot was practicing to land on short tracks that were in his simulator. Why did he do that? It can be understood the pilot who is on major crossings. Say in case of a glitch, you have to know how to land short. That could be a reason. For the Malaysian authorities, if the pilot trained to land on short runways, it's that there was another reason, more diabolical. Could this smiling face of a good family man hide murky intentions? The thesis of the pilot who wanted to end his life in the sky is a scenario studied very closely by the investigators because it has already happened in the past. A pilot may have attempted suicide. It has already happened several times. In Morocco with an ATR-42, it happened off the coast of the United States with a Boeing 767. It arrived in Japan with a DC-8. I know of cases. But the suicide thesis doesn't add up, and for a very simple reason. Strange way to commit suicide. What about being able to take control of an airplane at 1 and 30 in the morning and to decide to go die at the end of the Indian Ocean seven hours later? What would you have done in his place to commit suicide? I would have taken the plane, hit the ground, and finished. Finally, international investigators rule out the hypothesis of suicide. There is no evidence to suggest a recent change behavior on the part of the pilot. No signs of social isolation or drug or alcohol abuse. 
And according to the flight simulator analysis, the captain would never have tested the same route as that of MH370. If the answer is neither in the cabin nor in the cockpit, it remains to explore the cargo bay of the aircraft. The disappearance of MH370 could be linked to its cargo. What was really inside the Malaysian Boeing? Oddly, families have had a hard time getting clear information on this subject. The company that is in charge of loading is based in Kuala Lumpur. Within the first few days, she stopped communicating. It no longer gives any information. It took so long to get the cargo manifest, which should have been released within a day, two days. And it was weeks before a full list of all the cargo on the aircraft was released. And that, again, was very odd. You will have to wait seven weeks for the company to finally publish the freight list. That list, there it is. But is it really complete? Several strange details catch the attention of families. Among the 224 packages stored in the cargo hold, for example, there are two tons of fresh mangosteen, a tropical fruit that looks like the lychee, that the Chinese love. And here, there is a small problem. The loading list we were given is completely crazy. We are told that there are 2,000 kilos of fresh mangosteen, whereas there are none in Malaysia at the time. So, if the packages don't contain mangosteen, what does it contain? This is exactly what passenger families want to know. The manifest is incomplete. What we are being given is wrong. When it comes to loading, there are things you obviously don't want to say. There is more worrisome. In the freight list, lithium batteries are also being charged. These batteries that provide energy computer tablets and mobile phones. According to the document, there were 2,453 kilograms in the cargo holds of the aircraft. Their transport is normally prohibited on passenger flights. Maybe that's why the Malaysian airline rectified the number and minimized the quantity. Uh, I think we carried about 200 kg of lithium battery, but those are considered to be non-hazardous under the ICAO or IATA, because as long as you pack them in a, in a manner that's, uh, that's actually uh, uh, recommended. Nobody is communicating about it because normally it's not allowed, since the accident that occurred in Dubai. It was in September 2010. A 747 from this transport company crashed shortly after takeoff. The investigation report accused the hundreds of lithium batteries that were in the cargo hold. Look what's left of the jumbo jet after the batteries have ignited. Nothing or almost nothing. So we know very well that these lithium batteries, when they are concentrated, they are explosive. The proof in pictures. Watch how four lithium batteries can catch fire in a few seconds under the effect of shock. If one starts to explode, the others are going to explode too. 200 kilos, even assuming that there are only 200 kilos, what is already huge, explodes. It makes a hole in the plane. We are 11,000 meters above sea level. Immediate loss of pressurization. There is no oxygen there were left. 10 times as many lithium batteries in the cargo hold of the aircraft. Imagine the impact on the crew and passengers. An explosive depressurization of the plane. Not only are you going to take a huge hit, your eardrums are going to explode, you're going to bleed from your nose, your ears. It's, it creates a feeling of euphoria, the symptoms are very, very vague. You might notice some tingling in your fingers. But above all, you are likely to pass out immediately. Be that as it may, the lack of oxygen means that in 30 or 40 seconds, it's over. Was the Boeing a victim of depressurization after the lithium batteries in the cargo hold exploded? 
The hypothesis is attractive. However, in the event of a fire, pilots are trained to avoid asphyxiation. We are trained to put on the mask in three seconds. The action that must be taken is this. Pump up the tubes, put on the mask for three seconds, we let go, we breathe. They may have lost consciousness before they could even put on their masks. On the plane, everyone is losing consciousness and dying. The autopilot maintains its course, due south, until there is no more fuel, and then the plane falls. This scenario of the depressurization of the device already occurred in Greece in August 2005. It happened with a Boeing 737 in Greece, where Greek hunters followed him. They saw the crew slumping, the passengers slouching. They had been victims of slow depressurization. Nobody had noticed. They had been asphyxiated due to lack of oxygen, and there was no way to wake them up. The plane continued to the end of its fuel until the moment it fell and crashed. Would MH370 have suffered a similar accident? The international investigation excludes it. But if so, where did the plane go? The resources deployed in the China Sea to find the aircraft are colossal. Around 40 ships and about 30 planes are taking part in the search. Nine countries are mobilized. The problem, it's that we're not necessarily looking in the right place. For a week, we have the research done east of Malaysia, in the Gulf of Thailand. We send boats, planes, absolutely huge resources, search for the plane in the China Sea. To tell us a week later, the plane was pointed to the west. Indeed, on 12 March 2014, four days after the plane disappeared, Malaysia provides essential new information. The night of the robbery, Military radars saw traces of MH370. There are quite a few of these primary radars in the region. They are essentially military radars. Primary radar is based on actually looking at the reflection of the thing in the sky, so you can't turn it off. You can hide yourself, but a, a commercial jet can't. When you have identified the planes whose existence you know on the tapes of these radars, in the end, a few unidentified planes will remain. Among them, MH370. And from that, we were able to deduce that they made a left turn going back over Malaysia. Incredible when, for the past four days, the plane was thought to have disappeared from the screens at this location, Point Hickory. Military radars, for their part, record MH370 changing its trajectory radically. It was as if he were retracing his steps in the direction of Kuala Lumpur. We're following this plane for about an hour, and we notice that he is turning to the left. It will run all along the border between Malaysia and Thailand, without ever really penetrating Thailand, nor Malaysia really. As if he didn't want to be stopped. Then the border turns to the right by more than 100 degrees, and the plane turns to the right by more than 100 degrees. At that moment, he was walking along the border between on one side, Indonesia, on the other side, Thailand. He fired a second time, because the border turns slightly to the left at Senvavurs Les Elas Andaman. Then you lose sight of it. Why is the Boeing following like this, the borders of Indonesia and Thailand, without ever violating the airspaces of these countries? For specialists, the terrorist trail is back in force. The drivers were acquitted. However, the plane is at this time in the hands of a perfectly trained person. The trajectory that is followed is a precise trajectory. It's not a random trajectory. 
When he goes over this border between Thailand and Malaysia, it passes by four extremely important airports. If it had been in an emergency, it would have landed. He would have sent messages by radio, by I don't know what means, he would have tried to land himself. However, it follows a complex trajectory who requires to know how to fly to be a truly experienced pilot. It's not an accident, an accident. It doesn't change course several times. And that's not all. A week after the Boeing disappeared, the Malaysian authorities discovered that the plane has been flying for hours on March 8, 2014. It is a satellite that confirms it. In Marsat, a satellite that received information from the Boeing 777, thanks to a small box. This famous ACARS case, it receives information from the engines in computer form. It's been cut, but behind this ACARS case, there is a small box called a modem modulator demodulator that translates this computer language into plain language. And it is this modem that sends a message to the satellites. So this modem has nothing more to transmit. But he sends a beep to the satellites every hour to say, I am here, I have nothing to say, but I exist. The study of these beeps by the company in Marsat will determine a line going from north to south, along which the plane was able to move. This line goes to Kazakhstan, to the north, and it goes off the coast of Perth, to the south of the Indian Ocean, to the south. It's not possible that he went back north, otherwise the radars would have seen it. So since he didn't go north, he went south. At 1.38 in the morning, the plane would have headed south, and according to this trajectory, the search area promises to be colossal. when it became clear that the aircraft may be to the south, it's such a huge expanse that simply flying over and looking for, uh, for some debris is very difficult, whereas comparatively, looking at the Gulf of Thailand is a lot simpler because it's just a smaller area. They were sent to a place where there are a lot of storms, a lot of wind, where there is a very strong sea, and where there are very significant funds. So obviously, it's the needle in the haystack. The haystack is absolutely gigantic. Once again, authorities are rushing to confirm. Flight MH370 ended in the middle of the Indian Ocean, west of Perth. The information is now official. The plane headed south. This announcement by the Prime Minister arouses the anger of the passengers' families. The families of the missing passengers are not at the end of their sorrows. Initial searches in this area gave them nothing but false hope. Why are we being sent 300 satellite images? Where are we told that we are seeing debris? We are shown debris that is more than 27 meters long, and you never find a single one. We had this constant flow of misinformation uh, coming both through the authorities and through the media, and it was uh, an absolute emotional roller coaster. All of a sudden, Australia tells us, I saw a kerosene trail over 100 meters long. The person who said that didn't think for two minutes. You can't find kerosene after three weeks. You know, you just get your adrenaline levels stable enough that you can take a couple drinks of water without it coming back up again, you know, and then something else happens. <laughs> Passenger families are so overworked by the lack of reliability of official information that they are going to revolt at a press conference. 
You can't go. You can't live here. Let's go. We are here. Waiting for you. 40 days. We want to know what happened. What the reality is. And then proof for families that the Malaysian government is lying and hides information. What is happening on the 28th day of research at sea? We know that black boxes only emit one month. Strangely, on the 28th day, two boats hear noises, a Chinese boat, an Australian boat. The Chinese boat said the next day, I'm sorry, I didn't record the noises. Do you believe in it? A boat that searches for and doesn't record noises, the Australian boat, I'm sorry, the noises were coming from my own boat. I would like to believe in a bit of incompetence. The Chinese boat, they forgot to register. But all this amount of lies, it's more than incompetence. In all air disasters, debris is always found eventually. What's new here is that for over a year, no parts of the Boeing have been located neither by boats nor by satellites. This gives this story a mysterious character. Look at past crashes, there is a history of evidence washing up for a very long period of time, large amounts of it. Indeed, let's take the example of the Rio to Paris flight. The Air France Airbus crashed at sea on June 1, 2009. While it took two years to unravel what had happened, the first pieces of debris from the aircraft have were spotted just a few days after the crash. In the case of the Boeing 777 Flying MH370, we will have to wait 16 long months before we find the first songs. These three pieces of debris, three elements of the plane's control, have been authenticated by the experts through a series of cross-checks. And a disturbing thing, they were discovered on beaches in the Indian Ocean, opposite the official search area. Retrodrift analyses have been carried out from where the plane is supposed to fall. What if the plane falls where the debris is going to go? It is clear that the debris is going to Africa. When doing retro drift analyses, the northeast coast of Madagascar must be impacted. On the 27 plane pieces, which are supposed to come from the wreck of MH370, half of it was discovered by Blaine Gibson. It's this man who looks like modern-day Indiana Jones. In December 2016, we met him on the beaches of Madagascar. Each piece of debris is a piece of the puzzle. It's the last hope of finding out how the plane disappeared and where. Blaine Gibson has a special profile. It's a wealthy American lawyer who, one day, a mission was discovered. Search for MH370 fragments on a voluntary basis. He comes to the island several times a year and chance often makes things right. Incredible. We passed by here a few minutes ago, and there was nothing. And now, just now, this piece just ran aground, which looks like a piece of the inside of the MH370 cabin. Incredible as it may seem, the sea has just laid there, before our eyes, this piece that sounds like the ones Gibson has already found. You have to be there at the right time and in the right place. Blaine Gibson tirelessly calms the beaches of Madagascar, and on this day in December, the fishing is miraculous. On that day, the families of Chinese victims had found what looks like a Boeing interior. Authorized experts need to examine this fragment to find out if it's coming from the Boeing. 
In my experience, they look like cabin interiors in every way. Across the ocean, the search for the wreck continues. Over the years, the exploration area has been expanded. Hundreds of millions of dollars have been swallowed up with no results. As a result, the families of the victims are beginning to have serious doubts. Calculations provided by the satellite company in Marset. There are very few people who believe in the possibility of the research area off the coast of Australia. In fact, based on the tally provided by the English satellite, it is possible to determine many other trajectories than the one retained by the investigators. All you have to do is vary the flight parameters to get new search areas. According to these four French experts, if the plane was hijacked by hijackers, then he could have headed for Christmas Island. But due to lack of sufficient fuel, it would have crashed southeast of this island. But for terrorists, there is a much more strategic destination in the Indian Ocean. Some people say there was September 11. Now the airspace is so closely monitored in the United States. Why not do a September 11 on an extremely important American symbolic basis? But on the internet, when you ask about Flight Image 370, a name comes up insistently. Wake up, people! There's a cover-up! I'm telling you, Diego Garcia, there's a cover-up! This theory states that MH370 was hijacked and that he would have finished his race on an island. Diego Garcia, located in the Indian Ocean, west of Malaysia, 2,000 kilometers from the Maldives. It's this sand and coral atoll, unknown to the general public, but not to the military. It is the most important air base in the world outside the United States, military base. There are B-52s, there are B-2s, there's Diego Garcia. It's an aircraft carrier. It's defended like 10 aircraft carriers. The planes we're hearing about right now, who are going to Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, all go from there. Today, Diego Garcia houses the most secret American military bases. This base specializes in espionage on satellites and on the espionage of submarine cables through which everything that is the internet passes. So obviously, if the Boeing had been hijacked to Diego Garcia Island, the American response would not have been long in coming. Given the surveillance of this island by the Americans, it is clear that they did not let them approach. They don't know the intentions of an unresponsive plane and who would head for Diego Garcia. At that point, they would have no choice but to shoot him down. But not everyone agrees with this scenario. One would have to imagine that Americans, to protect yourself, protect a base, would have succeeded in getting from President Obama, in a very short time, the agreement to shoot down a civilian plane with 239 people I on think board. we are in total fantasy. So is Diego Garcia's thesis fantastic? Maybe, or maybe not. This is Mark Dugain. In the past, he ran an airline. He is now a novelist and wrote a lengthy investigation into Flight MH370 for a major French weekly. If we take a step back and that we are rising up about this case, two things are incredible. The first is no debris, no witnesses, except what I could find. During its investigation, Marc Dugan went to the Maldives. A string of islands located 2,000 kilometers from Diego Garcia, and he interviewed witnesses. What they say could be one of the keys to the mystery. 
Mark Dugain goes there and other people go there and say that on an island south of the Maldives, people saw a big plane on the morning of March 8 fly at a very low altitude. An airplane with red and blue stripes. The inhabitants of the island have never seen it pass a plane the size of their life, and at such an altitude. They show me the size of the plane with their arms. They see the windows, so the plane is really very low. I have been interviewed. There is a fisherman who was at a place where he saw the plane coming, and he saw him leave. What is interesting, it's that he saw this plane make a turn. And that turn is a turn to the south, to Diego Garcia. If you understand Mark Dugain correctly, after its U-turn over Malaysia and its inconsistent movements in the Strait of Malacca, the plane would have followed a trajectory towards the American base in Diego Garcia. Passing over the Maldives. I spent, I think, three full days in this village. I realized that I was dealing with two extremely upright, extremely honest people, totally disinterested. They had no idea when they alerted the authorities, that is, the small police station on Hovadu Island, by saying, but how come? What is this big plane? Have you seen a big plane? And that's not all. A second, even more disturbing clue will raise new questions. Kids who went fishing see an object floating. First, they're a bit worried because it looks like a mine. Then they see it floating. They see that it's empty. They pick it up and put it on the beach. The army is coming. Apparently, it's not dangerous. It's all round with spikes, but obviously it looks a lot like a fire extinguisher. Could this gray ball be a Boeing fire extinguisher? To check it out, we went into the belly of a 777 similar to that of the Malaysian. It must be admitted that the similarity is striking. It's one of the bunkers, the front cargo hold. Where are the fire extinguishers? Fire extinguisher bottles? Here are these spheres. There are the same ones on the other side. These are the fire extinguishers for cargo holds. So these fire extinguishers, which release an extinguishing product, are used to extinguish bunkers when there is a fire. Depends on the nature of the fire. It's a ball like that, that we would have found on a beach in the Maldives. One of these balls, indeed, when it is empty, it floats. It's ticking in my mind and so I'm continuing the investigation there. And a soldier from the Maldives told me off. It's a Boeing fire extinguisher. Was it the Malaysian one? Right away, the Maldives said no, that has nothing to do with it. Since then, we haven't heard of it anymore. Who does this fire extinguisher found on a beach in the Maldives belong? The low hypothesis is that MH370 crashed off the coast of the Maldives and we found this fire extinguisher. And then the upper hypothesis is that the plane might have been shot down by American military planes because it was approaching dangerously from Diego Garcia Air Force Base. There he would have been shot dead, then debris from the wreck would have drifted 2,000 kilometers to the north in the islands of the Maldives until a few kids find that plane's fire extinguisher. If that is the case, we understand that they don't want the truth to come out, because it's very difficult to explain that a civilian plane was shot down. The silence of the Americans since the start of this affair is deafening. It's the most heavily policed area in the world. There are satellites constantly monitoring this area. With a satellite, let me remind you, they are able to see a moped in a parking lot.
Even Sarah Bike, the American woman who lost her partner, Philip Wood, in the drama, she also ends up astonished at the silence of her country. And that also makes me wonder. It's uh, not like Obama to keep his mouth shut on these kinds of topics, yet he's been totally silent on this. There is a disturbing silence. Usually they're the first ones you hear. They are the correctors of wrongs. Sometimes the American press is very offensive. She has this culture of investigation to search for the truth. And then nothing, nothing. We don't talk about it. And what further puzzles the families of the victims, it's that Barack Obama has remained silent again when seven weeks later, he went to Malaysia. Mr. Obama is going to Malaysia. An American president had never been to Malaysia. That's exactly when it happened. And then nine months later, Barack Obama invites Malaysian prime minister to play golf. It seems a bit playful, frivolous, but being invited to a round of golf by Barack Obama, it's one of the few privileges he grants to his guests. What did they say to each other on the screen between two or three holes? It must be said that in this type of case, the silence of the authorities is always auspicious to the emergence of theories that are more or less risky. Gailsen Watrelos, who lost his wife and two of his three children in the drama, is he also convinced that the Malaysian authorities hide something? What justified that? Who took the liberty of taking my family away from me? I need to know. I need to tell my son. He needs answers. So the father turned to the French justice system. She's the only one still investigating the disappearance. At the top of the state, on the other hand, it's radio silence. France, strangely enough, never said anything about this incident. When a flight crashes in Ukraine where there are no French people, we're going up to the front. Press conferences are held, international inquiries are requested. On MH370, there never was anything. Why? At some point, the BEA goes there at the request of the Malaysians, but who has no access to anything. At the head of the French BEA experts, specialized in aviation disasters, there is Jean-Paul Trovec. As soon as he arrived in Malaysia, the man already declared himself powerless. We had not imagined, no one had imagined that a pilot was going to unplug the transponder, the ACAR system, etc. It is obvious that with such behavior, I'm afraid there's not much we can one do. One gets the impression that the French authorities are not doing their best on this case. But also one has the impression that they do not get to the heart of the matter. It feels like no one wants too much to talk about this case. Five years after the start of the investigations, the same caution is required. It's written in black and white in the official report. In conclusion, the team is unable to determine the real cause of the disappearance of MH370. By the very admission of those responsible for the official investigation, the truth is not about to come out in the open. A press conference with great pomp. A 500-page report. All that for that. Even so, one sentence caught our attention. But then who could this third person be? A passenger? On closer inspection, the boarding list may not have received all the attention it needs. There are about 20 people where their activities should really be checked. Among the 227 passengers, there is a small group of travelers that are intriguing. What is astonishing? That's because there are 20 employees in the American company in Freescale. There was a whole series of Chinese researchers who had just applied for a patent for, in quotation marks, 
make stealth planes, that is to say not detectable by raiders. There were about 20 on board, that raises questions. The company has been very reluctant to communicate. That means who's on the plane. Who were these passengers? Did they have very confidential information? Possible because the company was developing a revolutionary program. The KL-02, a computer microchip with incredible powers, as this Japanese science journalist claims. Aboard that plane, there were 20 computer programs, 12 from Malaysia, from this plant, Freescale. The KL-02 and 3 are so small, they would fit very comfortably inside one of the dimples of a golf ball. That's how tiny they are. That's a little brain, an electronic brain that control a huge machinery, a number of functions inside uh, a tiny, let's say, robot, a machine, uh, both for civilian purposes, but more importantly, for military purposes. So did anyone resent the lives of these 20 engineers who had boarded MH370? Researchers who would have developed this ultra-modern chip, once on board a drone, it could be a powerful and destructive weapon. However, for the best aeronautical specialists, all this seems to be extravagant to say the least. They always say there's a conspiracy when there is a disaster, an accident, a tragedy, and we don't know how to explain it. While going through the passenger list, however, this is not the only troubling profile. Seat 29A was seated by a certain Mode Carol Selamat. This Malaysian is an aeronautical engineer. Strangely, he's sitting just below the SATCOM, the satellite communication system thanks to which the plane interacts with the outside world. Could he have hacked the system and sent false data, thus preventing the final destination of the Boeing 777 from being known? To date, as official investigators say, it's impossible to disprove it. Finally, there is one last scenario left. It is worth paying attention to, even if it sounds like science fiction. What if someone had taken control of the Boeing without being on board? Is it possible to hijack or crash a plane remotely? A lot of people don't want to believe me when I say it. I think you can control planes remotely. In fact, George Bush said it after September 11. He said, we need to be able to control our planes from the outside, the day when there are terrorists on the plane. And we will look at all kinds of technologies to make sure that our airlines are safe, and for example, including technology to enable controllers to take over distressed aircrafts and land it by remote control. Boeing has applied for patents, and a lot of other companies worked on the idea to take control of an airplane, despite the pilots. That is to say, the pilots are prevented. They can't do anything anymore. They don't have the upper hand. I think this technology has been around for a long time. It is not new, so that's one of the possibilities. At some point, you take the plane under control. We can do it from inside the plane from a computer, as you can do from outside the plane, logically. What if all of this were true? What if the Boeing had been handled from the ground? By whom? Mystery, again, but there is a catch. How can you imagine that such a system could have been installed in the bowels of the Boeing without any technician? Does no engineer notice it? I don't believe that Boeing would be able to secretly put these pieces into the plane and have no engineer around the world ever say, hey, what's that box? So they would have to be lying to every government. Rarely have I seen an investigation where the cover-up is at all levels.
I do believe that there are people who know more than they tell me. They may or may not know the entire truth, but I'm sure that information is being withheld, and it's being withheld for a reason. I am convinced that if this plane made it all the way, there is a number of people who have a small piece of the puzzle, a controller who saw something, a soldier who heard. For running an airline, I can't imagine there was an accident in an airline with that much. A lot of people know what happened. For families not knowing what happened, it must be just abhorrent. And I completely understand the infinite sadness what must these Chinese, Malaysian, French families have who are directly involved in this horror. It's a bit of despair that's starting to arrive and we say to ourselves, but when are we going to find out? Will I know someday? There are people who tell me, it will be harder the day you know. I don't know. Ghislaine Watrelos won't give up until we explain to him why did his wife and two of his children die in the MH370 tragedy.